There are quite a few science, technology, and society, STS types of issues with redox. Uh, for instance, you know, when we talked about voltaic cells, well, those are very, very important in, in our society, aren't they? Because um, so many of our cells, which are actually non-rechargeable a lot of times, those dry cells that we have, are really just a zinc can with a lot of MnO2 paste inside. And those two chemicals react spontaneously, where zinc can on the outside is actually, if you strip away the label of the Duracell, right, and you look inside, that's zinc, shiny zinc uh, metal, and that's the anode, and the stuff that's inside is the cathode and those spontaneously react. So if you don't use them, they're still going to actually react and die over an amount of time, right? So they have a shelf life. But what do we do with those little things in the end? Are we throwing them into landfills? Are we, are we actually ruining the environment with those chemicals that are then going to be able to corrode and then leak out all over the place? Well, yeah, we are. So it's probably environmentally responsible to use lithium batteries um, and the NICAD batteries, which are rechargeable ones uh, that we can use for longer periods of time. Uh, that might be better, right? Uh, and, and by the way, a car battery, well, that's kind of, that's a very, very important cell, and it's made up of lead and lead-4 oxide plates that are actually put together in, well, here's the thing. Each one of the compartments of a battery, of which there are generally speaking six of them in any kind of automotive battery, are really spontaneous reactions that are occurring that are each producing approximately two volts each. But when they're connected in series, that means that you can add together all of their voltages. And so a 12 volt battery is what we normally have in an automobile. But the lead that's in there is terrible and you putting those in a landfill site or just throwing them out into the garbage, oh no, that's just awful. That, that, that causes, lead is a poison, it's toxic. Right? So the thing is, we've got to be careful with those types of things and very responsible about how we actually uh, uh, treat those, uh, those voltaic cells once they're, they're finished being used. And by the way, a car battery isn't just uh, a, a voltaic cell because it can be recharged through the alternator and, and generator inside of a car, then you can see that a, 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 a car battery is voltaic because it produces electricity, but it's also electrolytic and it brings electricity back in, reverses those reactions that took place so you can reuse them again over and over and have a longer life for your battery. Okay, now, another type of issue is we try to prevent corrosion on this planet. And corrosion, that's a redox reaction. You know, anytime you have a, a change in oxidation number, you have a redox reaction. And let me explain something about that really quickly um, uh, because these, these types of things are important. Let me just throw this here. Um, sometimes you're going to be asked by, on a test or by your teacher or your prof or somebody like that, and they're going to say, is that a redox reaction? You're going to look at that and say, hey, that's a combustion of methane. That ain't no redox reaction. Yes, it is. How can you tell? And you can tell redox reactions really fast from each other. So really get this under control. What's the oxidation number for oxygen here since it's an element? Zero. Is it there? Zero? No. It's going to be minus two and it's going to be minus two over here. Done. Don't go any further. If you've got a change in oxidation number for any element from one side to another, another one, another element's going to undergo uh, the a change in oxidation state as well, and that's a redox reaction. So look, the idea is a redox reaction is just when you see a change in oxidation number, okay? Uh, that constitutes a redox reaction. If there's no change in any element from one side to another in oxidation state, that's not a redox reaction, okay? But when you have a redox reaction, and in this world, redox reactions are occurring all over the place because oxygen in the air loves electrons. And when you have oxygen and water together, that right there is the rusting half reaction, baby. That half reaction right there, which is located across from positive 0 0.40 volts on any half decent uh, reduction potential chart, to form hydroxide ions, these guys right here want electrons. And anybody, as you know how the chart is structured, if you have this half reaction here, and it's a reduction half reaction, by the way, I didn't put the electrons in, did I? Tisk, tisk, there's four electrons in this half reaction right here. This half reaction right here, reacting with anything on the right hand side, which is a reducing agent, below it, is going to be a spontaneous reaction. 
like if you had this reaction here and you have iron, the iron half reaction is here, here's the iron metal, here's the oxygen and water, it's left over right, when you reverse this one and add it to this one, you get a positive 0.85 voltage and you got yourself the rusting of iron. How do you prevent that? Well, you could paint the iron, you can coat the iron with plastic or something like that. Why do we paint our cars? To make them look pretty? No, I say. It's to prevent corrosion. Um, because cars are made out of steel, and steel is up to 95% iron with some carbon thrown into the mix, about 5%. That's steel. Um, so listen, how, how can you actually prevent corrosion if you don't employ those other methods? Well, actually, you can, uh, if you had some, some iron pipe underneath the ground and you wanted to protect it, you could attach electricity or electrical uh, lead to that, to that pipe. And I know that sounds kind of funny, electrolyzing, uh, electrically charging a pipe. But what you can actually do with that is, is you can run a current along it and the oxygen and water, when it comes down to that pipe, will say, give me your electrons. And the iron will say, uh, take the ones that are being given to me by the electricity flowing through me. And so, a low voltage type of current that passes along a pipe can actually protect it from the oxygen and water, which is going to act as the cathode in that circumstance. And the iron would be the anode. But the most elegant and cool way of preventing corrosion is to do this. If you take a piece of zinc and you want to protect a piece of iron, all you have to do is have the zinc touching the iron and when the oxygen and water come down to rust the iron, they rust the zinc instead. And it doesn't have to be that the iron is, the zinc is coated onto the iron, but you can do that. That's called galvanizing, like nails are galvanized. But you can just touch the zinc onto the iron and then it'll protect it for a certain amount of distance. If you had a long iron pipe, occasionally you would put a piece of zinc or magnesium, which is a good protector as well. And all of the, all that is happening is this. Remember, you have to have this oxidizing agent reacting with the strongest reducing agent. And if zinc is a stronger reducing agent than iron, as long as they're touching each other, the zinc will protect the iron until all the zinc is gone and then the iron will actually then react. That's cool. You're protecting the iron by sacrificing the zinc. The zinc becomes the sacrificial anode. And you're protecting it from the cathode. And that's cathodic protection.